but this is cool. See that? That's a, a really fun tool, and you can quickly cover the surface of something. And there's something about <clears throat> the fact that there's more than one kind of creates a balance. Because if you have just one tool, you know, one prong on this, your hand could rock or, or the application, the way it hits the surface, uh, could change depending on the angle of your hand. But there's something about having two that, that kind of like steadies it. So you can make a really, really, really nice, you know, um, wrinkle lines with, the, with a tool like this. And you, again, this is a homemade thing. You don't, I know there's guys out there, there's companies, not companies, but there's individuals that do, that, can, that make a living out of selling these things, but they're kind of expensive when you can just make these things yourself really cheaply, you know? Um, you know, it's just wire, you know, and, and brass tubing. So, you know, I'm going to hold this steady for a second just so you see what's going on there. This is a, um, a piece of steel. This is a piece of brass. And then this is a tinier loop of steel. Um, and then you just take, uh, um, you can do, even do it with a cigarette lighter or something like that. Get a low heat flame or like a, um, a, one of those small torches that you can get. Low heat flame, don't get a big ass welder or any of that kind of shit. Burn up your house. Just melt it, just not melt it, but heat it up just enough so you can bend it. The idea isn't to make it red hot because then you know, it, it, it messes with the, um, with the strength of the, of the metal. So just get it hot enough, not red hot, hot enough. And with a pair of needle nose pliers, bend these loops in there and then stick it in with, you know, into the brass. And then this connects here. And, uh, and really inexpensively, you can make a really good homemade tool. Uh, and I, home, some of the homemade tools are sometimes are the best, you know, like they really are, you know. Like some people were saying, you know, people, if you, if you think a spoon works for you or a fork, if it's a technique that works for you, you just use it. But these things, you know, like not only they're cool, they're homemade, they're, but they're also professional, professional quality. You know, like this is th these are these homemade tools are an industry standard. You know, um, you know, practically, I can't think of a sculptor that I've worked with that doesn't have some of these handmade tools. You know, like. Kind of part of part of becoming a, a a sculptor is is you know making your own tools. But this I like this tool a lot. As you can see, I'm using the shaky, wiggly hand technique <laughs> to create these um, nifty little here uh, uh, wrink really fine wrinkles. You know, those are those are those are fun. Those are really fun. <clears throat> the three prong you can you cover more surface with a three prong, but I actually think now that having removed one of the prongs, I actually kind of like the, just the two floating like that because it, it, you, can, you, you can apply like a really nice even, um, tech, uh, even uh, pressure, you know, without digging too much into the. I believe we mentioned this last week or the week before, but we actually have a course all about making your own oh, custom tools excellent. on the site. It's by Shannon Shea. It's called The Garage Monster's Guide to Sculpting Tools, and I have posted a link in the chat. Yeah, and Shannon's great. Shannon's a genius, you know, and, and a really cool guy, and, and I'm sure his, 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 you're going to learn some stuff by doing that. He's, uh, he knows what he's talking about. I'm gonna go back and soften some of these. <clears throat> Christine says she finds experimenting and making stuff to make stuff with is sometimes even more fun. Yeah, <laughs> the experimental thing and learning, you know, kind of learning as you go sort of is really fun. You know, it's like it's, you know, that's part of it, I think, the experimentation and trial and error and that sort of stuff, you know. Um, you know, like I was telling you at the beginning uh, of, this, of this particular class, um, 
you know, I didn't, there was no schools when I was a kid, and a lot of that stuff was, was uh, just finding those magazines that I showed you. But even with those magazines, they didn't tell you everything. You, have to, you were looking at it, you're like, okay, they're explaining this, but I don't get it. I really, really don't get it. So I made mistakes, you know, and, and I made my first few masks, and, and um, you know, and you learn by, by that trial and error and, and, and you know, making the mistakes and, and just working at it. You know, it, it's, it, that's part of it. That's part of the creative process. And the, I, I find every step in the creative process fun, you know. Every step of it is fun. I'm going to show you, I, I wanted to show you a, a quick vein technique. Um, unfortunately, once again this week, I forgot to bring my nifty clay extruder. Uh, it's just, um, it's a, you can get it at, at a hobby store or a art store. And uh, it's usually in the Sculpey section. Um, and you can extrude out, you know, stuff like this, you know, like just really quickly. It's, it looks like a syringe. It's made of metal. You, you, you jam your, uh, your clay into it. You squeeze it, and it, squeeze out a, it squeezes out a perfect little ribbon of, of uh, a little tube of clay, which saves you a lot of time than having to sit here and do what I'm doing. Like, uh, this, is, this, is, this is where a shortcut does come in handy. You don't, why would you spend all the time trying to roll this thing like this if you can just have a clay extruder, you know, and, and, um, and do it, you know? So um, I'm gonna show you kind of over here how to do, how to do a vein, okay? So um, clay is really, really dry, a little bit on the dry side too right now too, so it's kind of breaking up on me, but um, so I'm just wetting this a little bit because the clay is a little dry. Plus, when you're when you're kneading the clay in your hands too, um, just your the warmth of your fingers or and just your your skin itself dr draws moisture out of the clay, so it, it becomes like crackly and not that easy to work with. But I'm going to throw a vein on here, like for fun. Here we go. Okay, so. The, the technique with veins is try not to make them too straight, <laughs> obviously. Look at veins, look at anatomy. They're, they're squiggly, you know? And um, that's kind of like a cool temple vein there. So um, again, one of my techniques with, that I applied to doing veins is, as well is th just thinking your brain in an abstract way, uh, Ys and Xs. You know, and veins have um, the main vein and then the tributaries that break off, you know. So um, you, have a pretty, you have pretty big veins on the sides of your head, especially if a mon uh, with a monster character, you know. Um, well, that's a cool shot. It's very dramatic. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Um, so I'm going to put in, a, as you can see, in an abstract sort of way, this is a Y. You know, so you see, there's a it's a Y, so it's like there you're using you're using the Ys and the Ys and Xs, mostly Ys, but Xs Ys and in, in, in come in handy for doing veins because you have the main vein and then you have the the stuff that splits off, you know. So I'm gonna put another one here, kind of to do this. So like as you can see, I put I put like another little Y there like that. There's a Y here, and there's another Y there, you know, and then I'll put another one here like that. So you have a pretty gnarly temple vein there, you know. It's like you, if you look at anatomy and you look at anatomy books and whatnot, um, you'll see that you have these veins traveling up the sides of your head like that, you know, like a, a human especially in a hu if you look at human anatomy, there's these big gnarly veins that are on the side of your head, but most of the time you can't see them because they're underneath your skin, you know, like, or, you know, but have you ever seen somebody who's getting really enraged, you know? Um, sometimes the, the, side, the sides of, uh, of the temple or the veins on the sides of your head, like on your temples, will pop out, you know, you know, because the blood pressure is pumping more blood 
you know, into those veins, you know. So, um, so as you can see, like, it's almost like a tree, you know. You have, the, you know, because everything's radiating off of your heart, you know. Um, you got to think of this stuff logically. Don't put just a, a bunch of random veins on a, on, a, uh, on a head because then it won't look real, you know. It won't look authentic and it's, it just look dumb. There's just veins everywhere. Think of the fact that, like, your heart is the center of your body and the blood's pumping outward and in, so out and in, you know, right? You know, major arteries are, are, are sending blood to all parts of your body. So one of the things is sending blood to your brain, you know? So you think of like, a, it's, if it's a tree, this is, the, this is the root of the tree. This is the, the base of the tree. And then it goes out like branches, those tributaries, you know? Um, the main one being here and the branches kind of going out that way, you know? Um, <clears throat> So that's the, like, kind of basic theory of, of veins, you know. Um, I do see people do random veins, and they, they, they just don't look good because they're not thinking, of, thinking about it in those terms, you know. Um, so right now it's very much sitting on the surface, but you got get the idea. It's, if you look at it, if you really study it, it's like a tree. And if you look at, if you look at um, uh, an anatomy book, you'll notice that the veins in the side of the head have that kind of feel. Like it's it's growing, you know. It's a lot, you know. It's like a, a a motif in life that, you know, in nature that kind of repeats, you know. Like the base of something growing out into these smaller things, like a, like the branches on a tree. So so this looks really big and rough right now, but I kind of want a big monstery vein on the side of his head. But right now it's just sitting on the surface. I haven't broken that up at all. So now I'm I'm going to take this, you know, little troll tool, the infamous troll tool, which is the opposite side of it. And with the with the um, the pallet wood part, you know, and then I'm going to start like knocking down this edge because it's too strong, you know. So, <clears throat> like everything else, the amount of time that you put into this will determine how good it looks. If you rush through this, then it'll look crappy. If you spend your time and you're like, I'm going to blend all these out really nice, then you'll have a really you know kick-ass vein on the side of of your monster head, you know? A quick tip from Jonathan. If you don't have an extruder and you don't want to hand roll out these little worms, uh, you can take two sheets of acrylic or wood and you can roll out the clay between those uh, very quickly and evenly. That's Jonathan's tip. Like a clay roller. Yeah. So you can see like I'm kind of breaking these, I'm breaking this in, I'm making it feel like it's, it's eventually going to look like it's under the skin, you know, like right now the, the, when you first put it on there, it looks like it's just floating on top of the skin and you don't want that unless it's like a weird, you know, melting man, you know, like the Rick Baker's incredible melting man where the, the guy's skin sloughed off and then the veins are on the outside or like the so uh, invasion of the saucer men where it's a brain and the, the veins are on the outside, then in, in that case, you can, you can have the veins be floating on top because it's a, like a weird character that's like a skinless being, you know? But if, you, if this thing has a, if, if you have skin, you know, if you have skin over it, you gotta make it look like there's, the, the vein is actually underneath the skin. So um, this, this is what I do. And again, you know, it's not a race to do this, make it look cool. I yeah. so love that you mentioned Invasion of the Saucer Men. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're digging deep now, Norman. <laughs> Paul, that's, the great, made by the Paul, the great Paul Blaisdell. Yes, that's right, and foam fabricated. It was, yeah, pretty much foam fabricated. He, he did, um, in case those of you out there who don't know what he did, he did these really low, very low budget, some would call schlocky um, horror and science fiction films in the 50s, but he, he was a pioneer monster maker and he did some really cool outlandish ideas with no money, with literally a buck 98. He did these really creative designs. And one of my favorite things that he ever did was this movie called Invasion of the Saucer Men. And um, it's a fi classic 50s invasion, these little d dwarf midget guys wearing these enormous brain heads. And it's so pulp science fiction, you know, and so over the top. But it's a strong, bold design sense. And... 
and I, ridiculously iconic. Even though those things are crude, they're, they're, and they, because you didn't have much money, um, there was a lot of, you know, st they weren't done as, as cleanly done as something, let's say, as like Universal had, did the creature from a Black Lagoon, and they had a lot of money to make that. Um, you know, Paul Blaisdell had a, had a buck 98, and he did these really cool, clever designs, and they're just, they're just, they're really fun. And, and um, I've, I've actually included a link to a blog we did on Paul uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, guys, in the chat, you can check it out. Yeah. Uh, you've got the day the world ended. You've got she creature. It mm -hmm. conquered the world. Yeah. Fantastic stuff, and pretty yeah. much all foam fabrication. Yeah, all foam fabrication. But you know, one cool thing that he used to do, um, he he um, he actually had a, a a monster magazine that was like a, like a, a his answer to famous monsters that he was the editor of. You know, um, in the fifties, and it was called I think it was called if I remember correctly, it was horror horror monsters. And um, and it was sort of like in the, the the boom of of monster magazines and all stuff from the early '60s. He did he did this article every month on how to make a monster. So he showed some of his techniques. Which, and I have these. I collected these since I was a kid. And um, and I saw them. You know, I got them secondhand at comic book shops and stuff. And when I opened, I was like, "There's Paul Blaisdell showing you how to make a monster." And what's really cool about it, even though most of his stuff was predominantly foam fabrication. He actually did do this technique, which, as far as I know, he's the only person I ever saw do. He would sculpt something like this in, in clay, in, in wet clay and water-based clay, let it dry, shellac it, and then paint latex on top of it, and then peel the latex off, and then that was the finished mask. Rather than making a negative mold, you know, which is the standard technique we use, he would actually take, like if he sculpted something like this, for example, let it dry, shellac it so it's watertight, and then he would paint layers and layers of latex on it and then add the veins on top and fabricate on top of it and then pull it, pull it off, and then that was the mask. So if you see the invasion of the saucer, saucer men heads, I'm pretty convinced that that's how he did those because it actually has a seam on it if you look at it closely. So he did it in halves. It was like a front half and a back half. You know, so I find that pretty fascinating, you know? Like, it's like he kind of just... In engineer this clever, really cheap and inexpensive way to do, you know, to do a monster when he didn't have any money, you know. So I think it's, you know, I I think that kind of like, you know, sort of uh, spirit of, of like I'm going to figure out a way to do this even though I don't have the means to do it. Um, I think that's really cool. I just love that. Absolutely love that. You know. So back to veins. All right, so we're in, we're in doing some veins, and again, like every other step that I've showed you so far, in order to do these things right, you need to spend time on them, and and uh, it's better to spend time on it, do it right, than than rush through it and think that you can take a shortcut and and then you have something that doesn't look cool, you know. It's yeah, all the, about the, the cool shortcut factor. the shortcut mentality does not lead to inspiring artwork, guys. Sorry. Exactly. Hard work is key. Yeah. Putting, investing the hours and the time and, and, you know, and being passionate about it. To me, like, this isn't a chore, you know? Like, this isn't, you know, I feel lucky that, that I got to turn something that I, I, I was making monsters in my bedroom when I was a kid, and I, and I feel very fortunate that I was able to turn that into a career, you know? And, and you know, hey, there's sometimes you have to do things that you, you don't want to do or sometimes you don't like. A particular job isn't as fun as another job or something like that. Um, but um, but it's still there's nothing better than than to be able to do what you do that, what you would do normally. What if I were, were to be doing this in my bedroom? It's no different than doing it right now or whatever. It's you, it's a passion, you know, and it's, that's I think it's it's fortunate when you can turn a passion into something that you know is also a career. So so first and foremost, my point is be passionate about it. You know, like I actually it's interesting I. I, I'll get, you know, people over the years, you know, ask me questions about this business because, you know, I, you know, I've been doing it whatever for however long and blah, 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 and they want to know, like, stuff. And people have good questions, and then a lot of, but one question that I always get was, is, like, I was thinking about doing this for a career. And, like, I hate to say that, but 
I, I don't like hearing that. I don't like hearing about, I was thinking about doing this as a career. It's like people who choose this kind of thing, it's not, a ch it's not even a choice. It's not like, oh, I'm going to be a baker or a monster maker, you know? It's like, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, a, you know, um, whatever, uh, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, something, and then decide that, like, I'll either do this or I'll, I'll, I'll make monsters for the movies. It's like, if you really, really want to do something and you want to do it well, be passionate about it. Don't, don't think about it. Don't, don't think about it in the sense like, I was wondering, I'm, I kind of like this. I don't think, I don't think you're there. If, if, you know, it has to be like, I have to do this or else I'm going to die, you know, <laughs> you know, virtually, you know what I mean? Along those lines, you know, I, I get asked advice too, just having grown up around this stuff. Um, people are like, so how much time should I give myself before? Yeah. I, and like, well, number one, if you put a time limit yeah. on achieving your passion, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Get the time limit out of the way. Yeah. It's uh, a good and, point. And, and just do it. Yeah. There is no time limit. Yeah, a lot of people think that, like, um, I think a lot of people think that, that just because, oh, I, I, this is a whim. I, I want to do this. And then, and then you know, somehow they're just going to suddenly wake up and they're doing it. It doesn't really work that way, you know. It's like um, you got to really put a lot of time into it, you know. Um, there's, no, there's no easy path. There's no, like, what do, I, what do I do to get into the film industry? You know, that, I, believe it or not, people ask that question. Like, how do I get into the film industry? I'm like, that's the million dollar question. Like, if I knew the answer to that, you know, I would be selling that concept, you know, on street corners, you know? And, and you know what I mean? <laughs> like, making a gazillion dollars. There's no simple path, you know? So, you, I think that, I think if you just work your ass off at something, you kind of, just by, sh out of sheer will, you, you make it happen, you know? And that applies to anything, you know? So what I'm doing now, you can kind of see over here, is that I'm getting a soft little here, um, uh, soft brush, you know, like a s imitation sable. Sable brushes are ridiculously expensive, like real, because sable brushes are a is animal hair. So you don't need a, a fancy sable brush for this kind of work, because you'll destroy it, you know. Um, so I I recommend. Uh, there's a place here called Michael's, and there's also other places um, that actually have pretty decent brushes, imitation sable brushes um, that that you could buy relatively cheaply. Because I end up going through these things a lot, and I'll just I'll I just I, when they get blown out, I just throw them away. You know, uh, I'd rather I'd rather just throw them away than deal with like you know, if they get, once they get beyond uh, you know usable just throw them out and get another one so you don't want to spend you know ten dollars or fifteen dollars on a sable brush or more when you're going to throw it out after a few months you know so go out and buy a pack of brushes i mean there's there's beware of some of these cheap brushes though too some of them are um the bristles fall out of them and stuff like that so there are some cheap brands that really suck you know so um uh you know try to I know Michael's carries a nice brand, which I can't remember. Unfortunately, can't remember the name of right now. But they have a blue handle. I have some of them around here, and and um, you can you can buy those for for really cheap, and and they're the packet of them, and the bristles don't fall out, and they're nice soft imitation uh, sable like this is, you know. So you can see like I'm blending this in, excuse me, <clears throat> to um, so that the vein looks like it's underneath the skin. I, veins is another thing where it's like, I love doing veins. It takes time, but I love doing them. Just like ears, you know, like it's always these things that I see people kind of try to take shortcuts on and like don't don't really concentrate on them. It's like I always like to, those certain things are the things that I try to concentrate on more. You know, like someone's not spending the time to put a cool vein on something. Like, you know, I mean, I think that looks pretty cool. You know, it's like even though. It probably needs more refinement. It still needs texture on top, um, but it's getting there, you know. Uh, and you could take this, which again, you can further so soften these down by tapping on them like that, and then it, they start to feel like they're below the surface. 
And here's the other uh, tip on veins too. Um, notice on, on, notice that the vein, some of these like, even though the vein might carry all the way up in here, I kind of dove this one down a little bit more and maybe that one's a little more, it's not, they're not an even bump all the way, all the way through. They're, it's like, it feels like they're kind of diving, subtly diving up and, up and down below the surface of the skin, you know? That's one of the things to make it look real. And then when they get to the, when they get to the end, they fade. They fade, they should fade nicely, you know? Yeah. There's a big honking monster vein there, you know? And then when you paint that, you know, it'll look really cool, you know? I'm, I'm gonna, I'll put some of these veins back here too, like, and you know what I'll do too is like if I, I, I could, if you really want to, um, going back to this back shot, you know, again, veins, everything grows upward like a tree. So you can even be like, I want to kind of map on roughly where I want to put these veins, you know, I'll do this kind of thing, you know. So that's where I want to lay my veins. I want to do this, right. And then those lines right there, it's just, it's kind of like you sketched in where they're going to be. So then, then you take your clay, you know, again, I don't want to have to sit there and roll up all this stuff. So if I were to be doing this, I would use that extruder, like I told you, but you know, then you, you can kind of have a place where you're going to place those veins, you know. Like now you, you've talked about Mitch Devane as your your poor texture hero. Who's your vein sculpting <laughs> hero? You know, do you have one? <laughs> well, you know, the, the uh, funny you should ask. Yeah, the, the um, Rick Baker again. All, a lot of paths lead back to Rick in my brain because I s studied his masks and stuff, but. He did this alien that was in, I probably brought the magazine here, in fact. He did this alien that was used in Star Wars, but it was just something he had done prior to Star Wars, you know? And um, it, it had this bulbous head, you know? It was almost like the Outer Limits six-finger guy. And it had these amazing veins. And in, in, this, in this magazine, um, they put this really cool profile photo of, of you know, dead profile, kind of like that. Of, of the uh, of the alien, and it had these amazing veins that radiated up into the head like that, and I was like, "Damn, that's I never saw anybody do something like that." You know, like I honestly had never seen anybody do an alien head like that. It felt so fleshy and so real, you know. And then the the vein work just felt so organic, you know, coming up. So I would say, probably in in the mask world, you know, that's a nice shot right there. You know, in the mask world, um, probably. You know, seeing that that bulbous-headed uh, alien that Rick did probably was the most influential thing. So we got that going on there. So then, so I'm going to want to have to go back. We're going to have to put um, pores on top of that. So you could. I didn't really work on this. I'll, I'll leave that alone. This I'll probably end up redoing that all together crazy about that because I, I, I much prefer to do it with the extruder so let's get rid of that um, <clears throat> so let's go back to this thing so I'm going to use this and I'm going to start putting a little bit of um, have you ever played with negative veins where you're you're actually digging trenching out um, that's Where really cool because we've, we've seen that. Don Lanning actually does that. That's interesting. Where yeah. some of his vein work will be raised and then others he'll trench it out. Yeah. So no, it's literally that, that's, a negative. That's really cool. And then that actually, that does happen on, on, the, on the human body. Like if your arm is down, especially, I'm not a particular, I don't have a particularly veiny, you know, vascular arm, but there's people that you see that have really super veiny arms. And when their arm is down, all the veins pop out this way. You know, and then, but then if they raise their arm like that, um, you do, the vein does go in, you know, because I guess all the blood leaves, goes, wants to go on, tr gravity wants to have all the blood go down. So when you put your, your arm up, um, does, the vein kind of collapses down because it was formerly had so much blood in it, then it collapses down, you can see the trenched in. It's a really weird phenomenon, you know. Um, I love stuff like that. I mean, that's what you should be doing there out there too, studying stuff like that, you know? Don't take nature for granted, you know? 
or, and, and be like, oh, I, know, I could do this. I'll just throw a vein on there. What difference does it make? It's an alien. You know, an alien can have any kind of vein. Well, but no, you really, really want to um, uh, have it be tied into reality somehow. Uh, no matter how outlandish your creature is, you know, it, what will make, make it feel like it's living is the, the more living looking you make it, you know? That, it's really that simple. Like, it's like no matter how crazy or wild your, your, your thing is, I mean, you can look at some really crazy, you know, des designs out there, and somehow it's still tied into something real, you know, something that feels uh, like it could be alive, you know? You, you can really notice it sometimes on your hand. That's a really cool thing. That's phenomenon. what Kavi said. Yeah, no, uh, you're, yeah, actually, that her you're hands right. do that. You notice it more on your hand. Yeah, and especially like if you hold, like if you kind of hold your arm and you 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 uh, put a lot of um, force and, and make your veins pop out, and then you suddenly raise them up, you'll see them collapse in. It's a really, it's a weird, it's a weird, uh, it's it's really cool. But that's that that's you know you come up with ideas like l looking at stuff like that, you know, like study things, you know, um, you know when when I think of like really crazy creature design like really outside the box type stuff, you know, like, like you got, okay, uh, Giger, you know, Giger probably did one of the most, one of the wildest things anyone had ever thought of, and that's combining machinery with, with flesh, you know, um, you know, Giger took, the, had this idea of like, I'm going to take tubes and wires and machinery looking stuff and combine it with, with, with flesh and somehow it makes perfect sense when you look at it, it feels real, you know, it's like, and that's kind of the point that I'm making. As outlandish as that design is, he, it, it's still tied into reality. You can't get any more outside the box than combining flesh and machinery, you know? That's about as outside the box thinking that you can get, you know? Um, another, another example of outside the box design work is uh, Wayne Barlow. He's another incredible, incredible, um, you know, designer. And I, Got the pleasure of, of, you know, working with him peripherally on on uh, on uh, Hel the Hellboy movies, you know, and um, he was one of Guillermo's uh, designers on that, and you know he certainly had a big hand on on a lot of the stuff in that show, and uh, he's another really outside the box guy. Like he he takes flesh and kind of like some of his skin textures and stuff look like they're wood, you know, like, like they're like carved wood or cracked, like cracked plaster and weird stuff like that. But yet it, it's crazy. It's outside the box, but it's still, he uses reality. He, he does it in such a realistic way that, that it's, it's completely convincing, you know, completely convincing. I mean, look at Guillermo's, um, uh, the, um, the devil's backbone, you know, um, with the ghost child and that, uh, they put cracks on his face, almost like broken porcelain, you know? I mean, that's some outside-the-box thinking. You're like, okay, why would his skin crack like, like if it's this delicate porcelain? But it really works, you know? Like, you look at that makeup, and you're like, wow, it's a strong, really bold design, you know? A really, um, you know, uh, really iconic image. And, and he created something that, that no one had ever seen before. And what's funny is now you, I, I'm starting to see that motif in a lot of, you see a lot of ghost stuff that has those kind of cracks and stuff on it. First time that anybody had ever seen, seen it was Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Black. No. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. But uh, um, how do you like that for a setup? No, uh, um, no. The, the first time anyone had ever seen those cracks was was that was that uh, was uh, the Devil's Backbone, you know. And and now you see. Suddenly, a lot of people, when they do ghost designs and things like that, they do this weird cracking like that, you know? It all came from Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> um, but, so, 